This week, the consecration and dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gaysburg, Pennsylvania. There are, of course, other actions that happened this week, some that might be very important. Sherman reaching Chattanooga, more of Texas falling, and even Nathan Bedford Forrest riding free. But nothing will ever compare to the sheer awe that surrounds that small town in Pennsylvania. First thing this week is the wretched force receiving a gift from Jefferson Davis, a command of West Tennessee. While some look at the man as a dashing general, I don't think that comes from his actions in the war. At least not so far. He has won some small raids, but that's standard for cavalry commanders, especially in the Confederacy. At the big battles, from his retreat at Fort Donelson to his rear guard at Shiloh, he has been adequate. So why do I hate him so much? At least so much more than other rebel raiders. It's his treatment of slaves and free men. But I've gotten sidetracked. Forrest is free of Breck and now is a target. Well, a vague direction. West. The next thing is something huge. The first of the 15th Corps reaches Chattanooga. Sherman has arrived with some 17,000 men, all good soldiers, coming off the back of victory. Sherman speaks with General Grant and the two begin work on an assault of Bragg's army and the breaking of the Siege of Chattanooga. Then for the other campaign in Tennessee, Major General Ambrose Burnside has led to the city of Knoxville moving southwest, giving an opening for Lieutenant General James Longstreet. If Longstreet can take the town of Concord, he can split Burnside from his base and return the city of Knoxville to the Confederacy. Both sides race for the important pathway at Campbell's Station. Whoever gets there first will get Knoxville. 9,000 men under Burnside, 12,000 under Longstreet, both march to a station best known for its uh, uh, dirt pike, I guess. The rebels try multiple times to entangle Burnside's army in a battle to slow them down, but against all odds, Burnside's men make it there first. By 15 minutes. Not willing to let the Federals get away, Longstreet orders two of his divisions to assault. Air General Lafayette McClaw and Bird General Micah Jenkins, who hopes their simultaneous advance will destroy the outnumbered army. Unfortunately for Longstreet, the assault isn't simultaneous, with General Jenkins falling way behind, going for both assaults to be beaten back, and <laughs> Burnside slips away. Now for some Lone Star State action. Major General Nathaniel P. Banks has recently closed off the cutting line by taking Brownsville. But that isn't enough for him, because it wasn't enough for the presses. He now wants Corpus Christi, but to take the town, he first needs to take Mustang Island and its rebel garrison of 100 men. Banks sends General Thomas E.G. Ransom to take Fort Seams on the island. One volley later, all that remains is the fort. One shot from the USS Monahegala later, the fort surrenders. Banks has won another great victory, but the papers still don't care. Now then, the main thing this week. On the 18th, under the fog of night, President Lincoln boards a train heading west. He holds in his hand a small piece of paper with a few appropriate remarks. It's hard to know what exactly the man was thinking as he stepped onto the steam engine. Maybe it's of his sick son, Tad, or his wife, Mary, who had to stay at the White House to tend to their child. The president's thoughts are interrupted by Secretary of State William Seward, who asks everything is okay. A simple nod is his response. 6 p.m. The rearing of the wheels halt as the procession of politicians and nobility exit the Iron Hall, step onto the platform, of the Gettysburg Railroad Station. President Lincoln walks to the Honorable David Wills house, where he is to stay for the night, and with Wills, walks to the cemetery's gates. The scene of the tombs is haunting. There are far too many of them for any heart to bear. The soul of Lincoln sinks. Till he is handed a telegram, his son's condition has improved. With this brief glimpse of hope, Lincoln asks to be taken to Seward. They are seen through the streets as the Baltimore Glee Club serenades the president with song. Throughout the night, sleep doesn't grace the chief's eyes as he works tirelessly on his speech. To a knock on his door, it's time to join the procession. All of night has passed, and Lincoln didn't even realize it was 9 a.m. After putting on an outfit so he wouldn't be indecent, he joins the march the cemetery at 9.30. It's a gloomy day, the crowds hugging tightly at each other, choking out any sunlight that could warm the bloody soil. As everyone takes to their seats, Lincoln walks slowly to the platform where he takes his. He sees six governors sitting with him. Mr. Curtin of Pennsylvania, Mr. Bradford of Maryland, Mr. Todd of Ohio, Mr. Parker of New Jersey, Mr. Morton of Indiana, and Mr. Seymour of New York. Finally, he glances towards the main attraction of this event, Mr. Edward Everett. A friend of the late Senator Daniel Webster, a politician from Massachusetts, considered the greatest American orator to ever walk the land. 
the Honorable Everett will deliver the main oration of the day. Music plays as the 15,000 spectators take to their places as the consecration folds. As the music of Mr. Breaker Field's band plays out, Reverend Chase Stockton rises and leads the people in a prayer. It must be pleasing to the heavens, because as the voice is joined as one, the sun pierced through the sky. The warmth of its embrace hugged the people of Gettysburg. Next played the Marine Band, which continued the spirit of mourning and loss. Finally rose the Honorable Edward Everett, who delivered a two-hour oration of the Battle of Gettysburg. Through his style and his words, he compared the Battle of Gettysburg to that of Marathon. Its language, beautiful, and it works together perfectly. It calls not just to the ancient Athens, but to more recent civil strife, like the War of the Roses and the Thirty Years' War. As evidence, the nation broken apart by civil war can return as one. Speech is beautiful and immaculate. The people are moved by every one of the 13,607 words. Everett sits down, and a hymn is played that, in its beauty, touches everyone's ears. Then speaks the president, who, like the ancient Pericles during the Peloponnesian War, reveres his predecessors, praises the unique democratic state, honors the dead, and exhorts the continuation of the dead struggle. The old man sits down. The choir takes over singing. For the final benediction, by Reverend H. L. Bogger. Following the consecration, the party travels to a local church for a service, and at 6 p.m., Lincoln boards the train and rides to his sick son. He had accomplished what he wanted to do. The reaction may have been mixed, but the job was complete. Love of the speech is along party lines, but there's at least one gigantic fan of it, Mr. Everett. I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. President Lincoln responds that he was glad the speech wasn't a total failure. I shall now end with the speech, specifically the Bliss version. There are many versions of the speech ranging from two that he prepared before, three he wrote after, and one from the press of the day. The Bliss version is the final one he wrote, and the only one he signed. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Hello, it's the entire Civil Week by Week team here, and this might be my crowning achievement. Not because I think I did a great job. I do not think I gave worthy notice to the words spoken by President Lincoln at Gettysburg. But because I feel so moved by the speech, honestly, I knew from the beginning I would never do the voice of Lincoln during the speech. There's far better people who did it. And I'm just... This channel has given me the opportunity to do so much. It has, and I'm so thankful for it. And it came from a kind of egotistical idea that I could do this. 
And while I've been able to make it week by week with a few minor exceptions, I could never capture the true majesty of this day and the ability to get close like Edward Everett to accomplish in three years what Abraham Lincoln was able to do in two minutes. I find myself also deeply honored. Thank you for watching.